Corrosion Part 1. Hello everyone, welcome to 2A Corrosion, uh, audio lecture 1. This is an introduction to corrosion, what is corrosion, and what are we going to be looking at in the rest of this course. By way of introduction to corrosion, here's a quote from the famous French chemist Antoine Laurent de Lavoisier. Now, Lavoisier said, um, in chemistry, in fact, in the whole of nature, which is mostly chemistry, um, nothing is ever completely destroyed, nothing is absolutely created, everything that happens, the only thing that happens in chemistry is transformation of some things into some other things. And uh, this is a um, this was a good summing up of chemistry at the start of the modern chemistry era, and it's still a good summary of what we do today in chemical engineering. Uh, we transform raw materials into uh, more valuable materials uh, using ma mainly chemistry. And um, not only is uh, Lavoisier an important chemist. Uh, because he had good insight into what his subject is. He's an extremely important chemist for you in chemical engineering uh, because he proved that mass is conserved in chemical reactions, um, including in the uh, difficult-to-demonstrate uh, mixed-solid-gas phase reactions. He showed that mass was still conserved, and therefore every time you use a mass balance in chemical engineering, uh, you are partly relying on the work of Antoine Laurent de Lavoisier. Now, um, not and uh, Lavoisier is in fact uh, important to you not not only because of his chemical insight and his proofs of conservation of mass. Uh, he's, he's also a, a fairly good role model for you uh, because he was so good at chemistry. Uh, he was put in charge of the French nationalized gunpowder production industry, and he improved it. He became very wealthy this way. So that's something for you to aspire to. Um, well, more or less, it didn't end that well for him because he became so wealthy the French Revolution took a dislike to him and executed him. But apart from that smut, don't worry, that probably won't happen to you. So instead, uh, I, we do encourage you to follow the example of Lavoisier. Um, when he was improving the gunpowder industry, of course, one thing he had to pay attention to was to make sure that uh, when he was transforming raw materials into gunpowder, there wasn't an explosion, that the materials, which were quite potent, uh, didn't transform his industrial plant into a smoking ruin. So Lavoisier, in that way, would be completely familiar uh, with some of the problems we can face today. The main difference in chemical engineering today is simply that it's on uh, a much bigger scale. So here's a picture of a transformation which takes place on a much bigger scale. Uh, this is a natural gas liquefaction plant, uh, I believe in Algeria, um, or at least it was. And in this plant, uh, it's simply refrigeration. So natural gas is being cooled down um, and so that it becomes liquid, which is convenient to export. And um, when we design these plants, we have to be very careful. Of course, not only do we do the transformation of the uh, the warm room temperature gas into the chilled liquefied gas. Uh, we want to do that transformation without any of the uh, gas or the, the stream that we're dealing with transforming our plant into a smoking ruin, which is actually what did happen uh, to this plant a few days after it was brought back online after some, uh, after some upgrades. Um, so how do we uh, how, how, do, how do we know what happened to this plant? Well, we aren't absolutely certain because there's not um, not a huge amount left of it. But what is what is thought uh, to have happened is that the uh, the natural gas uh, contained something uh, which caused the aluminium heat exchangers, which were liquefying the natural gas. Uh, it caused the aluminium heat exchangers to stop being robust metal pressure vessels and to turn into um, a, a weaker corroded material uh, with all of the mechanical strength of biscuit which was no longer able to hold in the high pressure gas during the liquefaction and uh, once the heat exchangers, the aluminium heat exchangers um, broke uh, then you very quickly have uh, a huge stream of natural gas which is easily able to destroy the plant. So how this actually happened uh, we'll come back to uh, later, in this, later in this lecture. Um, but for now, let's say we want to avoid this kind of problem happening in our chemical engineering. So to do that, we're going to look at a number of different topics. So this course is divided into six different sections. In this one, uh, introduction and definitions, we'll look at people's definitions of corrosion and give examples of uh, corrosion phenomena so that you see why corrosion engineering is important to you in chemical engineering. <coughs> 
and we'll look at examples of the most important metals that we need to worry about. Um, in parts two and three, we look at thermodynamics and kinetics of corrosion. So that means, uh, does a particular corrosion process happen in some situation? That's thermodynamics. And if this process does happen, how fast, how badly does it happen? That's kinetics. So sections two and three are important because they are the they will be the algebraic core of corrosion. Uh, once we can use them to make quantitative predictions about whether some simple processes happen, uh, then we can look at section four, localized corrosion mechanisms. So corrosion phenomena, uh, these are going to be how these simple processes um, manifest and become more complicated in the real world where we actually need to deal with them. Once we know about these real corrosion phenomena, then section five will look at corrosion protection. So how can we slow down or stop corrosion completely? Um, all of those sections one to five will look at um, electrochemical corrosion, which is relevant to metals um, in aqueous environments or when corroding in, um, in the atmosphere, assuming it's a humid atmosphere. Um, section six will just look at another important but less common topic, um, high temperature corrosion of materials. So that is for does a metal corrode if you're using it in a furnace or as some sort of heating element. Okay. Um, so what are the recommended textbooks for this course? So in my list, uh, books one to four are um, classic books on corrosion. They are somewhat old now, um, but they are good in that they are relatively, in particular, um, M.G. Fontana, or Mars Fontana's book, Corrosion Engineering, is a nice compact textbook, which I think is the genre-defining textbook which, sets, which defines the layout of modern corrosion courses. Um, so it will cover all of the fundamental knowledge you need to know in this course, uh, but because it's an older textbook, the diagrams could be better and there could be more of them, and it could give you the algebra in a more friendly way with a few more equations. So books um, 5 to 7 are more modern textbooks on corrosion. Um, Roberge is the opposite of Fontana in that it's... Um, a very long and comprehensive textbook with lots of diagrams and actually some very good photographs of corrosion phenomena. Uh, the main problem, or the two problems with Roberge are one, it's extremely long. Um, as many modern textbooks, it's simply too much to have to read. And its second slight drawback is that it does not have very much on the algebra, which does form an important part of this course. So book six, um, Adrian Fisher's Electrodynamics is a good one to look at. Um, just chapters one and two of his book on electrochemistry will give you a, um, a good, concise introduction to the algebra that will be used in sections two and three of this course on thermodynamics and kinetics. Um, and my book seven, Zaki Ahmad's Principles of Corrosion Engineering, um, is possibly, um, as a single book, it's probably the best modern style textbook as an introduction to the undergraduate course. So this one gets recommended by some supervisors uh, these days. So what it does have is extensive algebraic um, demonstrations and examples uh, presented at a, a friendly level which is approachable um, as an undergraduate introduction to electrochemistry and corrosion. Um, it also has, uh, I think it comprehensively covers, more comprehensively than Fontana, it covers with bullet-pointed lists uh, most of the, or all of the, important corrosion phenomena and corrosion protection methods that we need to deal with. Um, the only drawback, I think, with Ahmad's book is that I don't think it'll win any Pulitzer Prizes there are some bits of the wording which could be tightened up and made a bit clearer. Nonetheless, it's probably the best individual modern style textbook uh, which I can put on this list. However, you might not want textbooks. If you want, if you prefer online courses, I think the best online course resource on corrosion for you is on the Material Science Department's Do It Poms website. So it has a section on aqueous corrosion, which again uh, follows it follows the pattern of Fontana and gives you all of the important algebra and uh, descriptions that you will need for this course. So those are a variety of different resources for you. Okay, in chemical engineering, we design things. 
like heat exchangers or distillation columns. And the purpose of this is they're going to be containing some sort of often corrosive chemicals uh, so that we can transform those inputs into a more valuable product. Now, we need to do a lot of calculations to make sure that our system uh, will do what we expect it to. And a part of that in chemical engineering is a, a stress analysis and pressure vessel calculation, or it's a, a mechanical structures calculation to find out is a particular piece of metal thick enough to, uh, to sustain whatever design stresses it's going to endure. Now, in this corrosion course, we're interested in a step which comes before those calculations. Uh, we're interested, before we waste our time doing difficult engineering calculations, um, can we first of all make really sure that the metal we're choosing to build our system from doesn't simply dissolve in whatever environment we're putting it in? Or maybe it does dissolve slowly, in which case we need corrosion calculations to tell us um, how, uh, how much uh, thinner will a pressure vessel wall become after a few years of service. If it's just a few millimetres, then maybe we um, accept using that material, but we need to know how much thinner it's going to get, so that we add that as an allowance uh, before we do our stress analysis calculations. Okay, so in order to... Um, do this corrosion course, we're fundamentally interested in the bold lines in this diagram. So we're um, trying to understand cor how a corrosion controls material selection. Um, and so when we have some particular choice of metal we want to use, we want to know how does it, um, how does this material and whatever structure it is, a pressure vessel or a bridge, how does this react with its environment? And we need to look at the electrochemistry the thermodynamics and kinetics, which will tell us algebraically, in simple terms, um, how, the, how, how is this material, is it going to corrode catastrophically, or is it going to corrode slowly in a way which we can make an allowance for. So in chemical engineering, we are really interested in whether we have dissolution, uh, just loss of uh, metal due to corrosion, or we're interested in whether we have a decrease in fracture toughness of some alloy uh, because of its exposure to some oxidizing environment. Let's look at uh, what is corrosion, um, not for our specific purposes, uh, but as a, a general definition from corrosion science. And I want to use this definition in the box from, uh, from M.G. Fontana. He says, in his general definition of corrosion, corrosion is the deterioration of a material by chemical reaction with its environment. That's it. Now, um, this is the general definition I want to use in this course for corrosion. So that's the answer to the question, what is corrosion? Um, obviously, it has many implications, so we'll look at some examples coming up. Uh, before we do that, let's comment that um, there are different authors who use various different similar definitions of corrosion. So, um, various authors will be quite mean, and they'll say, um, in practice, everything that we do in corrosion science, almost everything involves looking at equations to do with the deterioration of metals. So why do you say that this subject is the study of materials and not just the study of metals um, and how they degrade in an environment? Um, the answer to them is that there are many materials like reinforced concrete in which, sure, the um, the deterioration as a whole, it involves steel reinforcing bars corroding, but in order for reinforced concrete to fail, we actually do have to understand how the material fails as a whole. Uh, we have a cement, uh, a cement material used to encase the steel rebars, and the failure of the material doesn't involve just the metal. Um, it involves water seeping through the cement um, in such a way that the water then reaches the steel rebars the corrosion of the steel rebars, then, then it creates rust, which um, involves a volume expansion um, relative to the original metal, and so you have uh, rust causing internal stresses, which then fractures the cement and more completely allows water to seep in to get to the steel rebars. So for many materials, we can't study the deterioration and failure of important engineering materials like reinforced concrete unless we study the material as a whole, and therefore corrosion science is not only uh, the study of the deterioration of metals.
That's uh, one alternative definition. Um, another alternative, the worst definition, the one I like the least, um, is the um, is the one which says corrosion is like extractive metallurgy in reverse. So the idea that people have in that definition is that metals are thermodynamically unstable, and they came from um, oxides or sulfides, which we dug out of the ground and refined into metals. And fundamentally, they say, corrosion is looking at the process of the metal turning back into its original oxide or sulfide form. So while they have uh, some idea, uh, a nice idea of what's happening there, I don't like it because it misleadingly suggests that corrosion is literally uh, the process of refining metals from their base ore reversed. And that's simply not true. So aluminium, for example, is refined into metal by uh, electrolysis of a molten salt solution. And yet, when aluminium, uh, when an aluminium boat corrodes in seawater, the process that's going on really doesn't involve a molten salt solution at all. It involves totally different electrochemistry, and so that, that's why I like um, Fontana's definition. We're looking at deterioration of a material in general. Let's not um, restrict ourselves to something uh, poetic about this process being um, extractive metallurgy in reverse. Okay, so there are some definitions. Um, and now, before we go on and look at some examples of corrosion, uh, let's uh, say, as well, along with definitions, there are important conventions which uh, vary. So corrosion is a reasonably well-established subject. It goes back a um, hundred years as an algebraic subject, and therefore there are some different conventions that have been used over time. Um, the ones that uh, will uh, notice as we come along is that we will be using some graphs which show the speed of corrosion which we're going to talk about in terms of an electronic current density and we're going to look at that as a function of the um, the oxidation potential exerted on a metal by its environment and to plot that graph we have to choose whether which which of those properties goes on the x and y axis so we're going to be using um, log of current density on the x-axis of the diagram uh, but that that convention is different in different fields of electrochemistry in particular in the fuel cells world it's not that uncommon to find log of current density on the y-axis of the graph. Um, there are some more important conventions. Um, because we're going to talk about corrosion, uh, the speed of corrosion in terms of uh, current density, uh, we will need a, uh, a plus or minus sign convention to say positive currents, in our case, correspond to anodic processes or metals dissolving, with um, negative currents are going to represent uh, cathode processes. So um, things like electrode plating. So that's a convention, and we're going to be using anodic anodic corrosion currents are going to be positive currents in our work. Okay. Um, another thing to watch out for is standard pressure. So it's now 10 to the 5 pascals, or 1 bar. It used to be, in some older books, um, 1 atmosphere, or slightly more than 10 to the 5 pascals. Um, so that change is important, um, or rather, it's important if you really want to very precisely understand what's going on in the Nernst equation when we uh, make corrections to redox potential to understand uh, to understand uh, what, uh, what corrosion potential we have in a system. Okay, so those are some conventions to watch out for. Um, it should be apparent from the notes what we're doing uh, when we get to it later in this course. So let's get to the essential question of this course. Why is corrosion important to you? Answer, corrosion is important to you because it's very expensive. Um, large studies in the United States have found... And these, I'm quoting United States studies because it's a big advanced country and because they love keeping enough paperwork uh, that they can actually make these estimates of what is the cost of corrosion to the whole US economy and answer, it's between 3 and 6% of GDP. So that's a lot of money. It comes about from, um, if you want to give examples of capital expenditures, it means it's because corrosion leads to us needing to replace things earlier than we would otherwise need to. Uh, for example, pipelines for water or oil, they rust through, they need to be replaced. Uh, vehicles, uh, the floor of old vehicles used to rust through and your foot would go through the floor and then it's time to replace the car. Um, in chemical engineering, we also worry about operational expenses. Uh, for example, in heat exchanges, uh, we have a, a fouling uh, allowance so that we say 
our surface of our metal where we're trying to get heat to flow between uh, a hot stream and a cold stream. The surface of the metal has some rust or other oxide corrosion products. It decreases, it adds the to the heat transfer resistance of the system. It means that we need to build a bigger, more expensive heat exchanger um, and or it means we need to pump water faster to get the uh, the heat transfer coefficient up to mitigate the effects of the of the fouling layer resistance. Okay. Um, other operational costs are the cost of downtime for inspecting systems to see whether they need to be replaced yet, uh, and the cost of uh, the cost of backup systems. Um, okay. So the here's a uh, couple of pie charts. Pie charts. God. Um, showing the costs of corrosion, which were found in different sectors of the U.S. economy um, in 2001. So, adding together a lot of industry sectors, the cost of corrosion, it says, uh, amounts in these sectors to uh, way over a hundred billion dollars. So, pretty pretty much serious money. And what is quite important to us as corrosion engineers is that the study found about 25% of this cost uh, could have been saved or eliminated um, if better engineering practice had been followed. So already um, the cost would have been even higher if there wasn't any corrosion engineering being done at all, uh, but there's still tens, many tens of billions of dollars per year in the US uh, to be saved by better corrosion engineering. Now I said this study found about 25% of the current costs could be saved. Something that's slightly amusing is that a similar study was done, an equally large-scale one, back in the 1950s. And it was found in the 1950s that uh, the cost of corrosion to the United States economy in the 1950s is about 3 to 6% of GDP. And about 25% of that, they said then, uh, could have been saved by following better practice. So this strikes me as an amusing statistic. It sort of suggests that, that there's been no improvement in engineering practices at all uh, in the last 50 years. And that's wrong. There have been. Um, it's just you can easily conclude that there haven't been, which I think is pretty funny. Anyway, so why, um, what, why, why, how does this statistic come about, despite the fact that actually um, corrosion engineering practices have become much better in the last 50 years? Uh, to think about that, uh, here on the left there's a picture of some, some cars in the 1980s, I think. Um, and a 1980s car, if left to its own devices, will, as this uh, next picture shows, it will um, rust through in a few years uh, because it was made of lots of components were made of steel steel wasn't particularly well protected so you could almost predict uh, to the year how long it would be be between buying your new car back in the 70s or 80s and you put your foot through the floor uh, because it's rusted through so actually the auto industry is something that has hugely improved its practices since the 60s and 70s, um, there's a whole range of new uh, corrosion control techniques that have been brought in. And actually, for cars, they partly because they've just swapped out metal for plastic, partly because they've protected the metal they have better, uh, there is way less corrosion. But the reason that there's still avoidable costs is not, um, it's, it's not that practices haven't improved because of inertia, it's because the conditions have got much tougher. So if we look at why. So in the case of cars, um, since the 50s, one of the big changes in environment is that we now, uh, we now actually worry about using salt on the roads. I mean, long in the past, yeah, people, if there's some snow, people just deal with it. Um, now, and you can see this has been building up over decades, uh, we pour lots and lots of salt on the roads, and this turns to be, to be, this is one of the most destructive things we can do for vehicles. So the Improvements in uh, manufacturing auto parts actually they've they've um, they've they've more than kept ahead of the uh, increasingly tough conditions. Uh, but this gives you an this gives you a, an example to think about about why um, corrosion is why there are still why there are still tens of billions of dollars to be saved. It's because if you think of a case like the oil industry, um, the environments are getting tougher. Um, at least as fast as corrosion engineering is getting better, which is good for us because it means there's still problems to solve. How is it that if we have um, ultra-deep offshore oil wells, 
um, how can we deal with the much tougher conditions um, which, which, which these uh, systems have to deal with. Um, we need to invent new ways of doing that. Um, and before we look at complicated questions like oil wells, um, let's then look at a, uh, a few examples of uh, different kinds of corrosion failures. Um, ways corrosion leads to capital expenditures. So this first slide, uh, this is uh, this is one I keep on my record. I like to keep a record of uh, things which the United Kingdom is the best in the world at. And one of the things that we're the best in the world at, uh, for a certain definition of best, is that we have the most in our capital city of London, we have the highest density of pavement explosions uh, to be found anywhere in the world. And a pavement explosion is shown in this photograph, and this photograph is quite postmodern because it's a photograph showing uh, a gentleman taking a photograph of an explosion coming out of some manhole um, in the streets in London. And uh, this explosion has been caused because, in this case, um, a, a common cause of these is that uh, old, worn-out mains electricity uh, cables, uh, they get perforated, uh, water gets in, mains electricity cables being at high voltage, don't react well with water, and so the uh, nice thick um, nice thick current element carrying thousands of amps or whatever uh, fairly quickly corrodes through, and then because you have a mains power system which is able to um, deliver lots of power to the point where it's uh, trying to now get current to jump a corroded gap, um, it causes this sort of explosion. And if there's, a, if there's a gas main involved as well, then that's even worse. So that's uh, an example of something which really should have been fixed by spending money on um, inspecting and maybe replacing your mains cables as necessary before they get to this state. Uh, but in fact now this is something that has a, a capital expense of replacing the, um, the cable and some indirect costs of downtime for all of the businesses that can't get their electricity until the thing has been replaced. Uh, what else? That's, one, that's an amusing uh, corrosion problem. What else have we got? We've got um, contamination. So contamination and poisoning um, is pretty boring. Obviously, if you have some sort of food processing business and you choose an inappropriate metal for containing your, your food, like tomato soup, say, uh, then you could get a poisonous metal, like, say, copper, dissolving into this uh, food product, and that would be unacceptable. And you, you would, of course, identify this um, in testing before you sell the stuff, but it's something that you want to design properly using stainless steel or titanium if necessary so that you don't have that sort of contamination. But contamination can be much more interesting than just uh, dissolving metal is bad for the environment or a potential poison. Um, what's, a, what's a good example of an interesting example of contamination being a problem in corrosion science? So, okay, uh, a problem which I came across a few years ago is a company um, wanted to measure the performance of their catalysts and to measure the performance of their uh, catalysts for doing some uh, process like breaking down uh, nitrous oxides into nitrogen and oxygen uh, they needed to put some test stream of gas into the catalyst so they had a, a mixture which was air plus a trace of nitrous oxide plus some ammonia and then they uh, put this through the catalyst, which is supposed to remove the nitrous oxides and break down, break it down with the ammonia, and then they measure the output stream. Now, corrosion here is, was a problem for the business because they had um, the input stream contained ammonia and nitrous oxide, and air, and the air contained some moisture, and so on the inside of their pipe leading to their catalyst, and of course this was a preheated gas stream, the uh, the pipe got some corrosive solution on the inside of it, and it became perforated by pitting corrosion. Uh, consequently, the ammonia and nitrous oxides in the input stream leaked out uh, before they got to the catalyst, and the uh, output stream was giving a quite spurious indication that the catalyst was doing a very good job at destroying the nitrous oxide and ammonia. It wasn't transforming them at all back to nitrogen and um, water. It was um, 
It was simply uh, not being given any to deal with. So contamination can mean uh, contamination of a sensitive measurement stream, and that can be as important as contamination in terms of poisoning uh, or putting some sort of pollutant into the environment. Okay. Um, poisoning, though, can just mean, or contamination can mean, uh, producing something poisonous. So uh, yeah, a good example of uh, corrosion doing um, poisoning people. Um, I keep this on file too. Uh, here are the um, the new euro coins that were brought in a few years ago. So when they were, there were um, a spate of articles in Nature and elsewhere um, announcing unexpected reaction to euro. Um, it says euro coins could cause itchy fingers. Uh, the reason for this is um, not only was the financial engineering of the euro questionable, uh, but the the um, the alloy engineering was also um, it was a question for a lot of people at the time. Um, the euro coins they were worried about, in particular the two the two color ones, uh, had two different metals, and their constraints on their choice of alloy uh, were such that they'd chosen a couple of nickel alloys, and um, it was a bit of a harder choice than when, in the day, you just had to choose a single alloy. And therefore, the alloys they chose, um, they, when they get uh, moisture on them from people handling the coins, uh, nickel from the alloy, it was said, would dissolve into the surface uh, layer of moisture on the coins. And um, dissolved nickel is actually um, it's a sensitizing allergen. So a fraction of the population, um, I think it might be as much as 5% or so, um, have an allergy to nickel, and that means that uh, if uh, if they, if they, if, they uh, if they were to handle these coins, uh, potentially after some time they, they would be brought out with a um, a, a nasty a skin reaction, um, and this was uh, this this was suggested as um, a problem with the new euro coins. Um, this was not universally accepted as a problem, so further tests uh, did suggest that there was no more dissolved nickel on the surface of these things uh, than on the surface of old-style coins, which people didn't have a problem with. Uh, so maybe it was psychological uh, that they had a reaction to using a strange, uh, strange money, which was uh, no longer under proper control. But anyway, not to be outdone, the UK, uh, when it replaced its 5 and 10 pence silver coins recently, uh, decided to replace the old nickel alloy, which was, of course, um, potentially could leach nickel. Uh, they replaced it, though. Uh, they decided to do one better than the, uh, the euro. Uh, they decided to replace these coins with uh, steel cord coins, which were plated in pure nickel. And uh, duly, exactly the same stories came out in the papers, that uh, potentially this pure nickel, um, you're going to get some dissolved nickel ions, which are going to be a, a sensitizing allergen, uh, which will cause some people to have a reaction to handling these coins. Um, this is not by any means a deadly kind of reaction or contamination, but it's an example of something which in corrosion science we ought to be able to measure to make sure we don't have too much of a problem from it. Good. Um, more serious problems that we're not just giving people a slight rash. Uh, let's come back to uh, the Algeria explosion. So in corrosion engineering, uh, we need to know a lot of things. A lot of corrosion engineering is straightforward um, metals undergoing electrochemical uh, corrosion in water or under moisture in a, a humid environment. Um, the Algeria explosion is actually a, a bit more interesting and complicated. So this was the aluminium heat exchangers were um, embrittled and then dissolved through by a component in the by a component in the natural gas stream. So, somewhat unusually, although this is an issue which is known in the gas industry, um, the corrosive, or well, one of the corrosive uh, species in natural gas is nothing to do with water or aqueous solution. Although water and sulfides are corrosive parts of many national natural gas streams, um, also. Um, the one which is relevant here is actually mercury vapour. So natural gas, you probably know, uh, potentially comes out of the ground very hot. And because natural gas is a fuel or reducing agent, uh, one of the things it can do is it can react with mercury sulfides in the ground and produce uh, metallic mercury. But if, if in, a hot natural, okay, in a hot gas stream, um, the mercury will actually boil into its uh, quite volatile vapour. And so natural gas coming out of the ground potentially contains, depending on where you are in the world, it can contain parts per million by volume of mercury vapour. And um, if you have such a natural gas stream, 
the crucial thing to do with it is to put it through a mercury trap, essentially a, a chilled steel system on which the mercury will condense harmlessly and can be taken away. Uh, you need to do that before you put your gas stream into most other kinds of metal because mercury has the property of dissolving lots of metals, including aluminium. So that, um, in this case, what happened is that your um, droplets, or quite a lot of mercury, pooling on the inside of an aluminium heat exchanger uh, will soon um, dissolve their way through the aluminium, and it turns the aluminium into a, a very, very brittle uh, ceramic um, um, heavily oxidized thing, uh, whereas the uh, the base aluminium would have been absolutely fine for containing the natural gas compression stream. Uh, the embrittled aluminium uh, soon had no ability to contain the gas, and therefore uh, the plant then exploded. Okay. Um, what's another... Uh, What's, a, what's, a, what's another a corrosion problem? So it's certainly the case that in chemical engineering, one of the big uh, problems, that one of the big industries which, in which corrosion is a problem for us is the oil and gas industry. Um, so about 25% um, or more of uh, accidents in the oil and gas industry are thought to be caused by corrosion. Um, this is a picture showing a, a gas, uh, um, oil pipeline in Alaska. It's not the most uh, not the most easy place, not the most um, easy environment in which to just go out easily and inspect your pipeline for problems. So, um, if you but if you, but you still need to, uh, because this is an example of a an oil pipeline that was not inspected often enough. It was pushed past its limits, and I believe the corrosion in this case was most likely caused by um, a buildup of corrosive debris on the inside of the pipeline and um, probably some sulfides turning to sulfuric acid uh, eventually um, corroded holes into the, the side or the bottom of this pipeline, uh, allowing a, a large and expensive spill. So that's then a, a, a $20 million fine, um, which that's part of the costs of corrosion, which should have been avoidable through proper practice of um, inspecting and cleaning the insides of the pipes regularly. Okay. Um, what other kinds of accidents do we have in corrosion? Bridge collapses. These are fairly standard. Um, I've shown a picture here of the Silver Bridge. Uh, it's collapsed in 1967. This one is an interesting one for corrosion engineers because the failure of the bridge is caused by... Um, it's caused by what was, when the bridge was built in 1928, it was a little-known phenomenon, which is that the the metal used to construct the bridge it would uh, gradually undergo embrittlement over time because of oxidation and its fracture toughness would decline and therefore the bridge where the metal originally it was very wisely over specified as it was constructed uh, but because of the decreasing fracture toughness and maybe some crack growth because of corrosion um, the bridge eventually was um, not able to, it, despite the fact that when it was built it was fine in terms of mechanical calculations, um, about 40 years later it collapsed because its properties had deteriorated too far and it was no longer up to sustaining its own weight. Okay, And a, a bigger and more destructive failure is this um, Mexico or Guadalajara sewer explosion in 1992. So this explosion uh, ended up producing a trench through the city which was um, six meters deep and two kilometers long. And this one is worth knowing about for corrosion engineers uh, because it's not the case that there was um, straightforwardly no corrosion protection on the underground petrol pipeline in question. It's actually the it's an explosion caused by a petrol a petrol vapor explosion, but the petrol pipeline itself was protected against corrosion. The issue here is that the petrol pipeline was protected using a method which was incompatible with the other uh, bits of metal work in the ground. And so the corrosion protection system for the petrol pipe um, caused a failure of a different pipeline, and that other pipeline then uh, damaged it was a, a water leak from the other pipeline, damaged the petrol pipeline uh, so as to break it and produce um, a sewer full of petrol vapour, which, after a few days, uh, produced this very serious explosion. Okay, so what then... Those are examples of why corrosion is expensive. What then are we going to look at in this course? So 
the remaining sections of this course, we wanted to predict, in section 2, will some metal that we're using corrode at all? So we're going to look at thermodynamics, and in thermodynamics we're going to find that a, a piece of metal in service can do one of three things. It might be immune from corrosion, like gold, in many situations. Or alternatively, the metal might undergo active corrosion. What that basically means is it will continuously dissolve. And the third thing that the metal might do in service is that it might become passive against corrosion. Uh, that means it grows a solid passive surface oxide, so that theoretically corrosion happens for a bit as this surface oxide forms, but, the, but then it, this surface film is then protective. And so those are the three uh, states that we're interested in in thermodynamics, is they're active, passive, or immunity to corrosion. Assuming that it's active corrosion, um, and also possibly if it's passive corrosion, then we need to look at kinetics. Uh, we need to know how fast does corrosion happen, and that calculation overlaps with um, sections 4 and 5 of this course. Uh, what do we do about corrosion, or how, do, or how does it manifest? So if we can predict the rate of corrosion, then we can um, see how much allowance uh, do we need to, uh, to, inc to include, or alternatively we can ask um, how can we measure this process and how can we slow it down more or prevent it, which we'll look at in section 5. That's what we're going to look at. Um, let's talk briefly about these mechanisms. So active corrosion um, we'll look at first because it's the simplest, the simplest problem to describe. Active corrosion we'll look at first for the simplest possible case, which is zinc dissolving in acidic solution. This is the simplest possible case because there are only two species or types of zinc that we need to worry about, the methyl, which is how it starts off, and the zinc 2 plus ion, uh, which is how it ends up. Um, it turns out in this case uh, the zinc 2 plus ion is the stable phase of zinc in this system, and so the zinc therefore um, dissolves and it doesn't have any other species to make it do something more complicated. There are no zinc hydroxides to consider, not if we're in acidic solution. So therefore, um, zinc is the simplest case of something which goes undergoes active corrosion. Um, iron is the example of a metal which undergoes a very complicated active corrosion process. Um, in the case of zinc, it's possible to summarize and say that active corrosion just means that the dissolved phase is stable, and therefore we have continuous corrosion. In the case of iron, um, active corrosion, again, we have a dissolved phase which is probably more stable than the metallic iron, uh, but the active ongoing corrosion doesn't only involve dissolution. Nonetheless, in this course, when we do calculations on the speed of dissolution of iron, uh, I will actually simplify this and we'll only look at, like with the zinc, uh, the, the step which involves the metallic iron dissolving into dissolved Fe2 plus ions. Um, in reality, though, um, once that happens, the active corrosion of iron continues in a complicated way. Uh, there's not only that redox process, but there's also an acid-base reaction. Um, Frequently, the um, the ferrous ions in solution, the Fe2 plus ions, uh, will undergo an acid base with hydroxide ions, and they'll form this um, ion 2 hydroxide, which is a solid phase and which precipitates. Uh, that's a white dust like powder, um, but then that itself uh, does more reactions. It can become hydrated um, and oxygenated, and it can turn into the ion 3 hydroxide. And the ion 3 hydroxide uh, can become further hydrated and it can turn into the, the orange rust phase, which you're used to seeing on iron and steel objects. So iron is a very uh, thing which does complicated active corrosion, um, and it's the, it's the most important thing, though, which does. And in order to understand it, we'll consider the simple behavior of the active dissolution of zinc. Okay, so active corrosion is one thing which can happen. Um, if we're really lucky, but we rarely will be with engineering examples, um, then the metal we're looking at might be immune from corrosion. Um, this can apply to things like gold plating in a, a mild or even a quite a corrosive environment. Um, it's simply that the metallic phase is more stable than any kind of dissolved ion or solid oxide, and therefore the metallic phase is immune from corrosion. Okay. And the third case we can have is passivity against corrosion. This is actually very common in engineering practice. Um, it means that there is um, 
the metal phase is not thermodynamically stable in some situation, but there is a, a solid, stable corrosion product which is stable in the situation, and this is a product which forms some sort of impermeable oxide or hydroxide surface layer, and therefore you have no further corrosion. So let's have um, so look at some uh, pictures of particular metals which do this. So as I said, zinc um, is a metal which tends to undergo active dissolution or corrosion, um, albeit often quite slowly in many situations. Questions which we might have to look at in this course are, how fast does the zinc dissolve in terms of millimetres per year um, in a, some situation? Um, issues we might discuss is that because it may dissolve quite slowly, um, how um, can we get away with using it? Or alternatively, um, is it going to be a good sacrificial anode for us to use to protect some other metal? Okay. Iron um, and iron alloys, so all of the carbon steels, um, are even more important metals. Uh, these generally do undergo active corrosion. Rust formation, uh, which rust being hydrated iron hydroxides and oxides, is something which is exclusive to iron alloys. So questions which we might ask in this course for iron is, um, again, how fast is the corrosion, the dissolution of the metal in millimetres per year? Um, how much would corrosion protection cost using some particular methods? Um, how much does corrosion protection cost compared with simply using thicker metal? Um, should we use thicker metal or should we switch to a more corrosion resistant alloy like some kind of stainless steels? Okay. Uh, metals which are passive, so aluminium and stainless steels are the archetypal metals which are passive in the work we're going to do. So aluminium um, will grow in many situations, it will grow in an Al203, uh, an aluminium oxide surface layer, which might only be uh, 1 to 10 nanometers thick. That's thin enough that you can't see it, which is why aluminium often looks uh, silvery, metallic, and shiny when you have it, but it, pro it does, does nonetheless have a too thin to see surface oxide layer on the top of it. Questions which we might have to answer in this course, apart from how does this oxide layer form and how might it break down, say by being scratched, um, we might ask um, how, do, how do corrosion phenomena affect this material? Can pitting corrosion uh, damage your aluminium? Or can um, stress corrosion cracking cause it to cause the aluminium object to fail uh, because of ox surface oxide growth or small amounts of crack propagation into the material? Okay, stainless steels are another example of materials which are passive against corrosion. Uh, they have a chromium oxide layer instead of the aluminium oxide layer. Of course, stainless steel is an it's an iron-based alloy, which and they will typically have. Um, at least 12, but hopefully you'd say 18% uh, chromium in the uh, in the alloy, and that's sufficient that um, despite the fact that the iron component would undergo active corrosion, um, there's enough chromium if you have an 18% chromium stainless steel uh, for a continuous layer of chromium oxide to form on the surface, and then you have not the active corrosion of iron, but you have the material behaving as if it's basically uh, pure chromium with a chromium oxide surface. So this uh, may be uh, passive. Uh, some of the questions which we might talk about in this course, um, important questions are, how does the passivity of stainless steel break down? Um, does it actually fail to be passive in some environments, like strong acids or chloride solutions like seawater? Um, and also, can the um, Passivation by chromium oxide formation, can this be spoiled um, when the stainless steel is welded? Uh, can this lead to the alloy no longer being able to produce this uh, passive surface layer for reasons to do with the microstructure? Okay, and two more, two more metals I'll talk about. So copper and gold are examples of metals which are almost, which are often immune from corrosion. Gold is very often immune from corrosion, and in this course the only questions we'll look at would be special cases when gold might dissolve actively, uh, such as in strong, uh, strong mixtures of nitric acid plus hydrochloric acid. Um, or we could also think about gold as a layer that can be electroplated to protect uh, something underneath it. Um, copper is a very interesting metal in corrosion science uh, because it's it's often almost immune from corrosion. 
Um, so this immunity, by the way, does not include when it's in seawater. So copper in seawater will slowly dissolve, um, but it's quite interesting to look at the exact thermodynamic diagram to see um, how does this happen and to what quite dilute concentration could the copper dissolve. Anyway, we know that the copper will dissolve in seawater because one of the reasons copper-plated, um, copper plated copper bottom chips um, were um, an important innovation historically is because the dissolving copper was toxic to sea creatures uh, which uh, otherwise like to grow on the bottom of ships and cause them to uh, cause drag and would slow them down. So a copper bottom ship, um, the copper dissolves fast enough that it's toxic enough to keep the bottom of the ship nice and clean. Okay, so we can talk a bit about copper and uh, what, what's that, what's that bio-macro fouling. Um, but we'll also, more importantly, talk about the thermodynamics of copper and uh, does it dissolve. Okay, so in what we've done so far in this course, um, I've given you a list there of some of the important metals that we're talking about. I've given you a list of the um, uh, important corrosion uh, problems, so where is it that corrosion is going to cause us some cost? And so now that we know what kind of subject we're talking about, um, in the next audio lecture we'll look at um, thermodynamics, so the electrochemistry of um, the algebra of how, uh, how do we tell whether or not a particular metal um, is going to dissolve actively or be passive or be immune from corrosion in some sort of situation. Okay, right, good. See you um, in the future.